This documentary presents information on Catalan and Scottish politicians and media, and will bring conflict on the official image people have of them. Viewers will have to deal with their dissonance, either accepting the new information or refusing it. Their decision will have an impact on both independence processes. September 18, 2014, independence referendum in Scotland. The referendum official results awarded the victory to the no by 55% against 45% for yes. Scotland has voted no. The result in Fife has taken the no campaign over the line and the official result... Independence no. didn't win, but it was a celebration of democracy. Wasn't it? We won't talk about William Wallace, Robert the Bruce, Bannockburn, the clearances, the tanks in George's Square, 1919, or the Clydebank Blitz, air raids in 1940, all of them of great significance in Scotland's history. Neither will we talk about the Scottish path to independence stated in the Declaration of Arbroath. The Declaration of Arbroath stipulates that if a hundred Scots ask for it, the Council of the Three Arms shall be convened to decide on Scotland's future. In 1707, the Scottish nobles signed the Acts of Union, Treaty on Union, the Union of Scotland and England to form one single country. The Scottish popular memory calls this bought and sold to the English gold. In 1979, Scotland held a referendum on self-government. Votes for yes surpassed those for no, but the referendum was not deemed approved since there was a technical trickery requiring a minimum of 40% of the electoral roll for the yes vote. It has been proved that in that roll there were people that had died long ago, and hence the Scottish popular saying, even the dead voted and they voted no. This case recalls what happened during Franco's dictatorship in Spain. Es mucho exigir el que yo nos pida a mi vez vuestro respaldo a las leyes que en vuestro exclusivo beneficio y en el de la nación van a someterse al referéndum. Pero las primeras 24 horas arrojaron un porcentaje superior al 95% favorable a la ley orgánica. In a referendum where also the dead voted, but in that case they voted yes, precisely what the dictator wanted. Also, the Nazi Germany ratified the invasion of Austria by means of a referendum, which obviously they won. So Austria lost its independence through a referendum. The fact is that referendum and democracy aren't synonymous. Neither are referendum and independence.
William McRae had a long association with militant groupings within the nationalist movement. On April the 7th, 1985, Willie McRae, lawyer and activist of the SNP, died under strange circumstances. He was found inside his crashed car with two shots in his head and a gun 18 metres away from his car, facts that contradict the official version of suicide. Besides, some confidential documents concerning his campaign to prevent nuclear waste dumping into the sea had been stolen from his house. These circumstances make his death an unresolved mystery after more than 30 years. Their trust, and we will deliver for them. The settled will of the Scottish people is there for all to In see. In 1997, a new referendum took place, and it was won by Scotland that recovered self-government. This entailed the establishment of the Scottish Parliament in Holyrood, Edinburgh. In a new building created by the Enrique Marias and Benedetta Tagliabu Catalan Architecture Studio. Initially, the Scottish Government lied with the Labour Party. This changed in 2006 with a narrow victory of 47 to 46 in favour of the Scottish National Party, SNP. Alex Salmond became Scotland's first minister. In 2011, the SNP won by absolute majority, starting the process and the countdown for an independence referendum. The SNP changed from no to yes for Scotland's membership in the NATO, similarly to what Felipe González did in Spain, going from OTAN beforehand no to OTAN beforehand yes. No queremos que España entre en la Alianza Atlántica. He defendido la necesidad de la permanencia de España en la Alianza Atlántica. And this, for a change, by means of a referendum. Angus Robertson, who led this change of position, is, like Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon, a member of the Privacy Council of the Queen of England, which is clearly inconsistent with being a Scottish pro-independence leader. On October 15, 2012, Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon on the part of the Scottish Government and David Cameron and Michael Moore on the part of the British Government signed the Agreements of Edinburgh, which resulted in the celebration of an independence referendum. However, they didn't mention that the document they had signed opened the door intentionally to the possibility of rigging the referendum in favour of the UK. The 18th of September 2014, we will hold Scotland's referendum. Margot MacDonald, beloved and respected deputy of the Scottish Parliament and former number two of the SNP, the Scottish National Party, required the British Secret Services not to interfere in the referendum and reported that the British intelligence had infiltrated the SNP. Going to see him win another glorious triumph. Yeah! Margot MacDonald died on April 5th, 2014, not being able to see the referendum. When the campaign for the referendum started, the victory of no seemed to be sure, for in September 2013 there was a difference of 28 points. This difference continued to narrow thanks to the good job done by the pro-independent supporters, who used their war cry, hope over fear. Fear was the main weapon of the better together unionists. You will be out of the European Union. The relocation of companies will cause jobs loss. You won't be able to pay pensions. Rupert Murdoch's newspaper, The Sunday Times, published a survey showing that for the first time, the yes outdid the no, and that was a turning point. This piece of news, strange as it came from Murdoch, a passionate unionist, provided an excuse to the leaders of the three unionist parties, Cameron, Miliband and Clegg, to go to Scotland and offer the vow. With some improvements in self-government. The vow, the commitment, was infringed after the referendum. Rupert Murdoch, owner of News Corp, is probably the most powerful global media magnate. For the Catalans, it's relevant to know that José María Aznar is a member of the News Corp board of directors. Another link Murdoch has with Catalonia 
He's the owner of The Times, whose editor in Barcelona, Stephen Bergen, founded Catalunya Today with Carles Puigdemont in 2004. On September 18th, the referendum on independence takes place. The official outcome is for no by 55% against 45% for yes. Alex Salmond, early in the morning and hurriedly, admits the defeat. Some hours later, he surprisingly resigns as Scotland's first minister. But for Scotland, the campaign continues and the dream shall never Right die. from the start, thousands of pro-independent Scots show on social networks their conviction that the referendum has been distorted. The unanimous answer of the pro-independence leaders and the media is to silence the people's voice and make a mockery of them. Scottish referendum irregularities, the rigorendum, as Scots call it. The Scottish referendum didn't have any of the guarantees meant for this kind of electoral process. There were no polls at the exit. The votes weren't counted locally at each polling station. There was no custody chain of the ballot boxes. Surprisingly, the contract to carry the votes from the polling stations to a centralised place to count them was given to the company IDOX, where Peter Lilly, Tory unionist deputy of the British Parliament, is the managing director. As Stalin said, it's not the votes that count, but who counts the votes? The activist Nomi Wolf delivered the pro-independence leader Tommy Sheridan hundreds of sworn statements from Scottish voters. They declared their ballots didn't have the compulsory barcode. I'm, I hold in my hand the named, identified, emailed, time, place, location, eyewitness accounts of 441 Scottish voters who have come forward to go on the record that they received blank backed ballots in your referendum. When I brought this to the Electoral Commission, they said, do not give this to us. They're preparing a report for Parliament and they said, we do not plan to include this documentation of these voters with their blank backed ballots. At the moment, as far as we know, nothing has been done with these sworn statements. Regarding the postal vote, the same night of the referendum, on a TV programme, Ruth Davidson, leader of the Unionist Scottish Conservative Party, looks calm and sure of the victory of no, because some postal votes have been opened, and that makes her feel optimistic. <laughs> um, I'm glad that you're mentioning uh, ballot boxes being opened, though. We know that during the campaign, we've, we've had that. We've had postal votes. Postal votes are going to be enormously important uh, in this campaign. Uh, about 18% uh, of the vote is going to come out of postal ballots. And we've had people at every sample opening around the country over the last few weeks while that's been coming in. And a quiet majority of Scots have spoken today. But is it not the case that postal votes, whilst they are verified, are mm. not actually opened until 10 o'clock on, on the night? Well, they're not counted until 10 o'clock on the night, but uh, different local authorities have had openings around the country. Uh, it is illegal to discuss any of that while any ballot is ongoing, so until 10 o'clock tonight, no one could talk about it. Considering this obvious irregularity, the defendant of the yes and close associate of Alex Salmond presents on the programme that Humza Yousaf let it happen and makes no comment. Perhaps what's most revealing is the irregular behaviour pattern of bets. One of the betting shops paid the no bettors the day before the referendum took place. 75% of bets were for the yes and came from Scotland. Whereas the highest bets, one of them of £900,000, a record in the UK, came from England, proving they must have had inside information. Scots bet for what they saw and Englishmen for what they knew. Everybody except the people of Scotland knew the result would be no. The day after the referendum, September 19th, small unionist groups dramatised acts of violence in George's Square, Glasgow. This was used in the social networks to scare the pro-independent supporters in case of a UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence. This UDI would have been possible after the rules established by the Hague International Criminal Court in the case of Kosovo. Back then, the SNP held an absolute majority to declare it. 
Social networks were decisive in two key factors. Firstly, they put heavy pressure for pro-independent supporters to join the SNP, which multiplied by five its members. London would rather neutralize one party alone rather than facing an out-of-control, broad-based independence movement. On the other hand, this increase in the party's membership gave her leader and New Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, a legendary aura that would enable her to take decisions contrary to independence without being attacked by pro-independence supporters. Secondly, social networks blessed the arrival of the National to newsstands. The National, just as the newspaper Ara in Catalonia, broke the current trend affecting published newspapers, most of them tending to disappear or lowering sales. The National presents itself as the only pro-independence newspaper, but it has three singularities. It has been created after losing the referendum and not before, which could have helped in winning it. It was presented at an SNP convention, giving rise to doubts as to its editorial independence and it is a property of the American group Gannett, the second largest media group in the world with links and interests contrary to Scotland's independence. In 2015, elections to British Parliament were held. The SNP achieved a great victory, moving from six up to 56 seats out of 59 possible seats corresponding to Scotland. The SNP, however, didn't declare the UDI contradicting what its own election manifesto established in 1997. In the middle of the campaign, Patrick S. Hogg, SNP councillor, had already suggested to the digital newspaper Bella Caledonia that for Scotland to be independent, they just needed to send a majority of Scottish pro-independence deputies to the British Parliament. So a pro-independence party, the SNP, with the absolute majority in Scottish Parliament and 56 out of 59 seats in the British Parliament, doesn't declare independence. In May 2016, elections are held at the Scottish Parliament in a confusing procedure, combining the majority voting system and the proportional voting system. The disastrous SNP campaign results in the loss of the absolute majority and a higher number of unionist seats. In June, the Brexit referendum in the UK reopens the debate on a new referendum on Scotland's independence. Since in Scotland, European Union supporters win by 62% to 38%. In 2017, early elections are also held at the British Parliament. The Conservative Theresa May surprisingly loses the absolute majority. In Scotland, the SNP goes down from 56 to 35 seats. Nicola Sturgeon, the mythified pro-independence leader, had been saying during the campaign that these elections were not about independence. However, she blames people's obsession for independence for the decrease in the number of seats. Nicola Sturgeon also uses these results to postpone the celebration of a new referendum, surprisingly enough, as the first referendum was held when they only had six seats, whereas now they have 35 seats, and contradicting an agreement of the Scottish Parliament to hold a new referendum. The Scottish Way referendum hasn't turned out well for the pro-independent Scots. In Scotland, the pre-referendum the referendum and the post-referendum have been lost. Nosaltres haguéssim volgut explicar al món que ens hagués encantat poder fer un referèndum com el que es va fer al Quebec o a Escòcia. Nosaltres hem dit sempre que volíem seguir la via escocesa. Jo crec que en aquest sentit li hem de reconèixer el know-how que té Escòcia en organitzar acords de referèndum. Que aquest hipotètic govern espanyol autoritzara un referèndum a la escocesa a cambio de que favorecería su grupo, ERC, la investidura de Mariano Rajoy. Un referéndum a la escocesa. The conspiracy theory is a conspiracy. The official version of the J.F. Kennedy assassination in 1963 is based in the existence of a magic bullet that changes direction four times and causes seven wounds. A magic bullet was essential to hide the existence of several shooters and lay the exclusive guilt on the scapegoat Lee Harvey Oswald. 
In response to the logical reaction of disbelief, the CIA, in an internal memorandum in 1967, decided to invent the term conspiracy theory to silence their critics. The conspiracy theory invented by the CIA is considered to be the most successful and durable propaganda campaign in history. Since 1967, 50 years have gone by and the term is still used to discredit alleged conspirationalists. The book Conspiracy Theory in America, 2013, states, upon studies conducted in the United States and Great Britain, that people labelled as conspiracy theorists are mentally more healthy than those who accept uncritically official versions. In 2019, the term conspiracy theory is only used by people in bad faith with the intention of discrediting people who want the truth to be known. It's also used by people in good faith utilised by the previous ones in order to hide the truth. The 25 Rules of Disinformation You won't discuss anything if you're a public figure, news anchor, etc. El ministro del Interior atribuyó inicialmente a ETA los atentados. Después no descartó que pudiera haber actuado otro grupo terrorista y, por lo tanto, se abrían nuevas líneas de investigación. If it's not reported, it's like it didn't happen. Only what appears in the media is real, the rest doesn't exist. You will label your opponents as radicals, conspiracy theorists, blame them of working for the enemy, etc., to silence their points. You will silence your critics. You will use your power to bribe or blackmail people who oppose your goal. Pounding on my door with an arrest warrant on the Patriot Act. You will demand impossible proofs and will refuse to accept the obvious ones. You will create bigger events, stories that draw attention on the news to distract from main issues. You will make an attack ad hominem to avoid the discussion. You will tell the dissident he's the mole. You will tell him he has a big ego or he's a freak or you'll pretend he's crazy. You will demand complete answers to complex issues and avoid answering on specific issues. You will play dumb and succeed in freaking your opponent out. and so on, until completing the 25 rules of disinformation systemized by H. Michael Sweeney. Internet has changed the techniques for the manipulation of the public opinion. We are in the disinformation era, where the tactics to deceive operate not only covering up the information, but rather by flooding, saturation and distortion. Demand impossible proofs in order to cover up the truth. One of the 25 disinformation tactics is to demand proofs. This happens both in the mass media and in the social networks and aims to prevent people from finding out the truth. The regime here has weapons of destruction. Are you sure? You can be sure. The powerful are never demanded for proofs. Iraq was invaded without any evidence of the existence of weapons of mass destruction. Proofs should be left for tribunals. Life is based on truth. The only tools we need to get to the truth are memory and newspapers archives. In politics, treason is proven when the opposite of what has been promised is done. Todo el mundo pensaba que en Irak había armas de destrucción masiva y no había armas de destrucción masiva. Eso lo sabe todo el mundo y yo también lo sé. Repeatedly failing the pledged timetable or refusing to exercise the mandate of the elections is the proof of treason. Espionage in the 21st century. Espionage acted by Spain in Catalonia is not about anonymous subjects passing information. Spain can obtain that information remotely thanks to the technology. Moreover, as Spain has positioned key people, considered by everybody to be pro-independence, leading political parties, Catalan civil society organizations and social networks, the Spanish government doesn't need this information anymore, for nothing happens unless they command it. For this reason, corruption cases, sudden changes of direction, undue delays, mistakes and struggles between parties are not due to a huge incompetence, but rather part of a plan in favor of Spain. 
In all states with counterintelligence tools, this kind of infiltration is the exception. In nations without a state, and in colonies, however, to place collaborationists in key positions is the rule. The colonizer state has no problem in choosing the most suitable people at universities and youth wings of political parties, allowing a control of the society equal to that of a dictatorship. Spain is a factory of secessionists. Uriol Junqueras, 14th of December 2013. It is false that Spain is stupid and the United Kingdom foolish. If it were so, Catalonia and Scotland wouldn't have been subjugated for three centuries. Spain and the United Kingdom apply their state instruments for an absolute control of the society. Spain and the United Kingdom may only allow themselves to create secessionists from the certainty that they control all the parties and the media. They couldn't care less having millions of secessionists if not one of them declares independence in the parliament. Spain and the United Kingdom control the playing field with parties and media covering 100% of the society. When detecting sensitivities beyond their control, they create new parties and new media to regain full control. This explains the continuous attacks to Catalan language, culture and laws. Spain is certain that the only reactions will be words not followed by actions since they have everything under control. How we are manipulated. Cognitive dissonance. It was Leon Festinger, an American psychologist of Russian origin, who first proposed in 1957 this theory in his book, A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is produced when new information runs counter to what you believe or love. In order to deal with this feeling, one may change his previously existing belief or else one may irrationally refuse to accept the new information. There are historical examples of cognitive dissonance affecting entire nations. This shows us that history doesn't confer second opportunities. Disasters must be prevented before they take place. We should move beyond our comfort zone. We should leave the convenient lies and face the unpleasant truths to change history. Leo Strauss or the systematical lie. As Noam Chomsky, you, Noam Chomsky says, Chomsky? most of the people have no idea what is happening and they don't even know they ignore it. Leo Strauss may not be one of the most popular political philosophers in the 20th century, but few have had as much influence as him. He exposed his theories at the University of Chicago. His acolytes, known as the School of Chicago, have implemented his theories from their positions in the American government, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the Bilderberg Club. Leo Strauss and his disciples have divided the world population into three categories. First category, the people, us, the 95% of the population who want wealth but are lazy, selfish, clumsy and stupid. We don't have the capacity of knowing how things really are, nor to be free. We have to be systematically deceived and must believe we are free, so we won't do anything to put an end to our slavery. Second category. The Gentile, the rulers, whose only goal is to achieve the glory. They consider themselves to be the guardians of moral and order. They are instrumental. They can be substituted according to orders of the third category, the real masters of the world. This explains some political suicides, only understandable if they are originated following superior orders. Third category, the wise, the real power, the ones that rule behind the scenes through the Gentile. They consider themselves pure and intellectually superior. They act without any ethical and moral limit. They decide which lies are to be transmitted to the Gentile, the rulers, so they can impose them to the people, all of us. To summarize, in the world there are only those who deceive and those who are deceived. If you haven't decided to start a war, if you haven't decided to call a global economic crisis, if you haven't decided to cause panic regularly with false flag attacks, pandemic diseases, presumably striking down mankind, 
and if you haven't decided to hinder access for some nations to their independence, you are, like us, part of the deceived. How we are being manipulated, Ash's theory of group behavior. In 1951, Solomon Ash conducted a series of experiments in which he mathematically and empirically demonstrated the influence of group pressure on opinions. How a person is manipulated the by the majority group. Uh, one. 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 Two. One. Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 That is the real reason of the false calls for uncritical unity, because an only voice defending the truth is enough to dismantle a big lie. It's the voice of the kid in the Emperor's New Clothes tale, in which 99.99% .99 of the population accepts the fraud of the invisible clothes for social conformity, until a kid dares to tell the truth. The Emperor is naked. The mass media, instruments for massive disinformation. As we've learned from Leo Strauss, it is necessary to deceive all the population, and this means keeping under control all parties, mass media and social networks. Clearly, the mass media have a critical importance in imposing the official narrative. This happens as much in dictatorships as in democracies. John Pilger is an exemplary journalist who has exposed the Vietnam War, Cambodia, the indigenous Australians genocide, etc. A writer of the Communist Europe told him in the 70s, We who live in dictatorships have an advantage over those who live in democracy. We don't believe anything appearing in the media, because we know these are lies and propaganda. Udo Ulfkotter, a significant German journalist, confesses in his book Gekaufte Journalisten, Journalist for Hire, published in 2014, he has been disinforming in favor of the power during 25 years, without contract, to leave no evidence. After publishing the book, Udo Ulfkotter died, allegedly from a heart attack, which in turn leaves no evidence. The bonds between journalism and politics are enough documented. As an example, the Operating Mockingbird, by which the CIA recruited journalists and created and controlled mass media all over the world, either in local languages or in English. Any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks, this I think gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into an executive session. Uh, at CBS, uh, we uh, had been contacted by the CIA. As a matter of fact, by the time I became the head of the whole news and public affairs operation in 1954, ships had been established, and I was told about them and asked if I'd carry on with them. We can also talk about the increasing number of journalists that have entered politics. Ruth Davidson, Carlos Puigdemont, Letitia Ortiz, etc. Rupert Murdoch, one of the current mass media magnates whose links with American secret agencies have been made public, is the owner of News Corp and is directly linked to the Scottish and Catalan independence processes. José María Aznar, Spanish ex-president who said, before Spain ever breaks, Catalonia will break first, is a remunerated member of the board of directors of News Corp since 2006. This complicity between politics and mass media help understand, now that the published media are in difficulties, the appearance of the newspapers The National in Scotland and ARA in Catalonia. The Boiling Frog A frog put in cold water which is gradually heated will not perceive the danger and will be cooked to death. When the water is almost boiling, the frog does perceive the danger, but it has already no force to jump out and is boiled alive. Similarly, nations are deceived gradually, so that when the deception becomes clear, they have lost its strength and are unable to react. To be nationally free, we must think freely.
In order to understand the process experienced in Catalonia over the last years, we must be able to put ourselves in the place of the actors involved in this process. And by actors we mean those who decide and not the Catalan people. The Catalan people are falsely posed as actors just to hold them accountable for the final failure. In Catalonia's independence, three actors take part. 1. The world. 2. Spain. 3. The Catalan political party's leaders. One need only look at the interests of each actor to anticipate without mistake what's going on with the independence in Catalonia. First, the world doesn't want independence for economic reasons affecting Spain, for problems relative to membership of new states in international organizations and to prevent a domino effect in other countries. But they are interested in maintaining the democratic appearance in the Spanish state. Second, the reasons of Spain against independence are to maintain the territorial unity, to continue plundering Catalonia and to preserve the national pride of an ancient empire now collapsing. But they want to maintain the fiction of democracy. Third, the interests of the political parties are attaining the power and securing it. Nowadays in Catalonia, this requires pretending to be pro-independence. However, between ideology and party's interests, interests always prevail. They don't want independence, they just want people to believe they have done their best to achieve it and in that way be able to retain their voters. So, the most convenient for all of these, the world, Spain and Catalan political parties, is to make a referendum they can rig and avoiding by all means a UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence, made by the Parliament, as this kind of declaration is impossible to manipulate and is in accordance with international law. So much so that the editorial of the New York Times of the 23rd of June 2017 wrote literally shamelessly, referendum yes, as long as the secessionists lose it. The referendum can be lost in different ways. One, it may not be done at the last moment another Basque country with the Ibarreche plan. Two, it may be purely symbolic and finally non-binding, another 9N in Catalonia. Three, the result may be manipulated to lose it, another Scotland. Four, even if the yes wins, the result may be ignored, another Greece. Five, it may be put off repeatedly to move it away until pro-independence majority has been lost, another Catalan model. We've learnt from Leo Strauss that almost all human beings have to be systematically deceived. We've learnt from the Ash experiment that for these lies to be effective, there must be no dissonant voice. It has become clear that the mass media are the ones who transmit these lies. And the bigger the lie, the easier it will be accepted as a truth. Clearly the deception has to be performed gradually to boil the nation slowly, like the frog. Incredible is not impossible. Sometimes when we don't want to believe something, we say it's impossible. Things happen because someone wants them to happen. Exposing the plan can prevent these things from happening and change history. The bigger the lie, the easier it is to accept as truth. The truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. Brian O'Leary. Grandes familias españolas que están controlando grandes empresas españolas. Ánimo ahí y entusiasmo a raudales. In Spain, the economic crisis and a widespread corruption mainly affecting the two most important parties, PP, Partido Popular, and PSOE, Partido Socialista Obrero Español, lead the de facto powers, the large banks, the public administration senior managers, and the powerful oligarchic families, especially in Madrid but also in Andalusia, the Basque country in Catalonia, many of them heirs of the former Franco's regime, to conclude that a renewal is needed. Los reyes acudieron a emitir su voto al colegio de San Fernando, situado en el Pardo. Furthermore, the European community has warned them that the situation of unruliness is becoming unsustainable from an economical point of view. Therefore, it's the moment for the great Spanish powers to change everything so that nothing changes. The machinery of renewal is set out. The crown passes to Felipe VI. Viva el rey! Viva! Viva España! Viva!
New parties like Vox, Ciudadanos and Podemos emerge from scratch thanks to the private and public media, especially television, controlled by the power. Spain has started a new transition. Spain, however, has a problem, its last colony, Catalonia. After 300 years of domination, Spain hasn't managed to assimilate the indomitable Catalans. The fact is, Spain has not even tried to seduce them in a civilized manner. From the 1917 military occupation onwards, Spain has exercised an enormous fiscal plundering, has continuously prosecuted the population for its Catalanity, including summary judgments and executions, has attempted a cultural and linguistic genocide and has sustained military occupation. However, Catalonia not only has resisted, but has had a good start in the 21st century. Catalans are entrepreneurs and hard-working, and their nation, despite being a Spanish colony, is one of the most productive and viable in the European community. For Spain, the most inconceivable is that, despite repression, Catalans have never ceased fighting to regain their freedom during these 300 years of occupation. And it is important to remember that it's every Catalan who wants it. Catalans, interpretant el sentiment i els anells del poble que ens acaba de donar el seu sufragi, proclamo la República Catalana com a estat integrant de la Federació Ibèrica. It's not an electoral fallacy from some party or some opportunist group, but the people of Catalonia who demand independence. To prevent the secessionist outbreak, Catalonia's autonomous parties propose a new statute of autonomy. Apoyaré la reforma del Estatuto de Cataluña que apruebe el Parlamento de Cataluña. A renewed agreement with Spain where the scandalous fiscal plundering is reduced and where Catalan culture, education and language are respected. On the 18th of June 2006, the citizens of Catalonia approved this new autonomous statute by means of a referendum. A few days later, however, the Spanish government contested it before the Constitutional Court that cut it all. No es cierto que yo dijera que lo que aprobara el Parlamento de Cataluña, sin más, lo voy a ratificar. No es cierto. The Spanish Constitutional Court sentence achieved two objectives. Devoid of substance the statute and prove that a referendum approved by the people of Catalonia is meaningless. A mass demonstration takes place in Barcelona. Officially, and after both regionalist parties, Convergencia Democrática, Unión and Esquerra Republicana, and the Spanish nationalist, Partit Socialista PSOE, it is aimed at protesting against the Spanish Constitutional Court sentence. However, the cry of the people is one and unanimous, independence. Referendums are not the path for independence, as confirmed some days later, when the International Court of Justice in The Hague, Netherlands, establishes in its own opinion on the case of Kosovo that a unilateral declaration of independence, UDI, is internationally legal. The race towards Catalonia's independence had started. In Orange de Munt, a Catalan municipality with a strong tradition of popular struggle, the population decide to organize a popular consultation on independence with a single question. Do you want Catalonia to be an independent state? Yes or no? The success of this consultation unleashes a flood of consultations all over Catalonia. 60,000 volunteers are mobilized and an overwhelming majority of more than 70% municipalities will vote in favor of independence. Spain feels threatened. The consultations are the expression, with no intermediaries, of the Catalan people's sovereignty out of its control. But two more factors threaten Spain's control over Catalonia. Juan Caratero, mayor of Puigcerda, one of the capital cities in the Pyrenees, founds Regrupamen, this party which escapes the control of Madrid and is outside the Catalan Regionalist Party's system, proposed to achieve independence with a UDI, a unilateral declaration. Juan Laporta, the successful president of the football club Barcelona, takes a step towards politics, approaching with a group of men. Per proclamar un estat català, per proclamar la independència de Catalunya. Ramon Carner, renowned entrepreneur, consolidates the CCN, Cercle Català de Negocis, Catalan Business Circle, pioneer organization in communicating the economic benefits of independence among the entrepreneurs in Catalunya.
The red lights turn on in Madrid and political infiltration is set out. Regroupement's management is infiltrated and a split is acted out. The key people in this split are the members of the FNEC, Federación Nacional de Estudiantes de Catalunya, National Federation of Students of Catalunya. The FNEC is a key actor in Catalan politics, having intervened in the management, creation and destruction of all Catalanist parties during the last 20 years. From the FNEC have come out Uriol Junqueras, Francesc Homs, Josep Brui, Joaquim Forn, Elisenda Paluzier, Eduard Sayen, Damià Calvet, Ramon Tremosa, David Raventós. Per la FNEC hi han passat el vicepresident Junqueras, el conseller Homs, en Ramon Tremosa, moltíssima gent que avui ens ajuda a tirar endavant aquest propòsit col·lectiu de viure en un país millor. Today, all of them but David Raventos have been strategically positioned in key places in the autonomous government, regional parliament, regional police, Catalan radio and TV corporation, Catalan media and organizations like the Assemblea Nacional Catalana. Their mentor is Juan Vivas y Sola Vicens, widely considered at the university as a collaborator of the Spanish secret services. Another strategic stroke performed by Spain to prevent a secessionist outbreak is the creation of a new party presented as pro-independence, Solidaritat Catalana. Its founders, Alfons López Tena from Convergencia Democrática and Uriel Bertran from Esquerra Republicana bring Juan Laporta with them, thus distancing them from regroupamen. Alfons López Tena, of Valencian origin, moves to Barcelona after having been member of the Spanish General Council of the Judiciary. He was accused of a criminal action for fraud, in which was also involved Javier Zaplana, ex-president of the Valencian Autonomy and Spanish minister that Spain had allowed to lapse. De la corrupción ya no preocupa a los ciudadanos porque ha desaparecido. Solidaritat's founding act takes place in the Aula Magna of the Barcelona's University of Economics, assigned by its dean Elisenda Paluzier, ex-member of the FNEC, former couple of the Spanish agent Vivas y Sola Vicens, and at that time Esquerra Republicana's national councillor. The strategy works. In the elections for the Catalan Parliament, Solidaritat wins four seats and gets to neutralize Regrupa Men, that remains excluded from the Parliament. In the Parliament, the parties Convergencia, Esquerra Republicana and Solidaritat achieve a large majority and Artur Mas is named President of the Autonomous Government. Artur Mas, outstanding regionalist, now declares himself secessionist and will be one of the actors working for Spain in the task of aborting Catalan's desire for freedom. The last stroke is aimed at the neutralization of the Serb Cercle Catalan de Negocis, firstly from the inside, replacing Ramon Carner, its founder, secondly from the outside, creating the Fundación Catalunya Estat, Foundation Catalunya State, targeting the same space of pro-independence entrepreneurs than the Cercle Catalan de Negocis. Finally, the ANC, Assemblea Nacional Catalana, Catalan National Assembly, is founded to incorporate and control the pro-independence bases that made possible the consultations for independence. Karma Forcadei, Sabadei's ex-city council member for Esquerra Republicana, becomes its first president. Later on, she will take over as chair of the regional parliament in 2015. The ANC establishes a system for the election of the president in which he or she can't be voted directly by the sum of the members, but has to be chosen by the 77 members of the Secretariat. This allows Jordi Sanchez, a collaborationist who had already been unmasked by the pro-independence activist Luis Maria Chirinax in his book La Traición dels Líderes, The Treason of the Leaders, to be named president of the ANC twice even if he wasn't the most voted candidate. On the 20th of February 2011, the first Solidaritat's party congress takes place. Its controlled demolition starts. Two candidacies are presented, one from the Alfons López Tena and Uriol Beltran's branch and the other from Juan Laporta and Anne Arquet's branch. The Spanish agent Juan Vivas y Soler Vicens devoted himself to making telemarketing among Solidaritat members, fostering virulence between the two branches. Vivas was officially linked to Durani Yeda's Unión Democrática, a reactionary and openly anti-independence party. This fact can only be attributed to a setup, since in the Tenran Beltran's branch there was Elisenda Paluzier, Juan Vivas y Soler Vicens' former couple, and in the Laporta's branch there was Ana Arque, who had been introduced by the same Vivas y Soler Vicens into the pro independence world. Anna Arque, at the moment of the completion of this documentary, is the spokeswoman of the new party Primarias Catalunya and Juan Vivas y Soler Vicens's couple. The split consolidates and Juan Laporta leaves the party. 
Now Lopez Tena and Uriel Beltran can devote themselves to playing extra parliamentarism, from the parliament to discredit the secessionism they claim to represent. Few months after acting out this split, Juan Vivas y Solovicense, Elisenda Paluzier, his former couple, and Ana Arque, his current couple, create an ICEC, International Commission European Citizens. President Artur Mas, ignoring the popular clamor for independence, carries the torch for requesting a fiscal pact with Spain. I més transcendent de la trobada d'avui amb el president Rajoy, s'obrís una porta clara a poder parlar a fons del pacte fiscal. The fiscal pact proposal hadn't any possibility to succeed. Spanish colonial strategy in Catalonia is infiltration. That is, promoting political leaders and creating parties and media on the pro-independence side with the purpose of blocking independence. <laughs> Following the script, a historical hug between Artur Mas, the conservative leader, and David Fernández, the anti-system coups leader, takes place. A few months later, also playing out the script, the same anti-system will bring down Artur Mas. Following the same strategy on the 25th of December 2010, Uriol Junqueras requests by letter to Esquerra Republicana, a formerly regionalist and now pro-independence party, his admission as a member. Only nine months later he will become its president. Junqueras jumped into politics at the FNEC, Federación Nacional de Estudiantes de Catalunya, in the 80s. In the early 90s he created the Bay and Josep Roy created the N, tearing the hegemonic secessionism at the university into three pieces. Uriol Junqueras goes from anonymity to being present at televisions, radios, digital press and associations. A star is born. Don't attack Junqueras, I made him president of Esquerra, flaunts Juan Vivas y Solovicens in close power circles. In this scenario, Ramon Carner, president of the Cercle Catalá de Negocis, and David Reventos, former vice president of the FNEC, initiate talks with the parties trying to attain the unity Catalans desire to achieve independence, talks which result unsuccessful at the express wish of Uriol Junqueras. 11th of September 2012, the Assemblea Nacional Catalana organizes the first mass demonstration for independence. Two million people collapse the center of Barcelona. The demonstration reaches the parliament. Carme Forcadé, president of the ANC, and Muriel Casals, president of Omnium Cultural, among others, get into the parliamentary chamber, where they are warmly received by President Artur Mas. To date, this is the official story published both in Spanish and Catalan media. What has been kept a secret to the people of Catalonia is that that day independence was about to be achieved. The initial plan of the Assemblea Nacional Catalana was keeping the demonstrators surrounding the parliament until a declaration of independence made by the pro-independence deputies holding the absolute majority was completed. The action had been prepared in detail. The operation was aborted at the last minute by Karma Forcadé in person. Only the pact of silence of all media prevented this essential piece of news from being known. It has taken seven years to see the light of day. Artur Mas calls anticipated elections for the 25th of November 2012 under the pretext of the refusal of Mariano Rajoy, president of the Spanish government, to negotiate the fiscal pact. In that election, the coup, Candidatura de Unitat Popular, enters with three seats. The anti-system party, with David Fernández heading it, gets for the first time into Parliament. Suspiciously, the coup, during the campaign, is supported by the powerful Godot group, La Vanguardia 8 TV Rack 1, a monarchist and Spanish nationalist group, and a key piece of a system the coup purportedly aimed to overthrow. In 2013, it becomes clear that neither the epic nor the massive commitment of the people of Catalonia to independence get an answer from their supposed leaders. On the 29th of June, at the Football Club Barcelona Stadium, the Concert for Freedom is held, organized by Omnium Cultural, an organization headed by the pro-independence activist Muriel Casals. We have an objective common, which is more important than each of our particular interests. The stadium was filled up with 90,000 activists wishing to regain Catalonia's freedom. Within a short time, seats were exhausted. More than 400 artists supportive with Catalan people's desire of independence performed there.
Also on the 11th of September, National Day of Catalonia, the Catalan way towards independence took place, a human chain spanning more than 400 kilometers, organized by the ANC, which mobilized 30,000 volunteers and was a great success with over 2 million participants and an only cry, independence. The Catalan Way has a precedent. The Baltic Way, on the 23rd of August 1989, a human chain across the three countries under the Soviet Union domination. But similarities are merely aesthetical. Unlike Catalonia, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, within less than two years, on the 21st of August 1991, were already independent. Their parliaments unilaterally declared independence, that is, they made a UDI. In the view of this huge mobilization of the people of Catalonia to demand independence, Catalan political leaders respond with the promise of a referendum, but one year away. There was an agreement to make the Catalan referendum before the Scottish one and to have a binary question, either yes or no. However, President Mass proposes a double question, violating the Venice Commission referendum stipulations and sets the date on the 9th of November much after the Scottish referendum, which means losing another year. Vol que Catalunya esdevingui un estat, escrit estat òbviament en majúscules, sí o no? Vol que aquest estat sigui independent, sí o no? Or no. The pro-independence activist David Reventos posts the video The Tricky Question That Kills Independence, where he already denounces the deception implied in the date and the question of the 9N consultation. El dia 12, el president Mas ens va sorprendre molt negativament amb una doble pregunta. Aquesta pregunta, pel fet d'establir una doble pregunta, fa baixar el suport a la independència entre el 15 i el 20%, donat que internacionalment, per reconèixer-la, continua sent necessari obtenir el 50% més 1. És contrari als criteris que imposa el Comitè de Venècia, que és de referència pel que fa a referèndums. The European Parliament elections in 2014 mean for Spain the starring appearance of Podemos, Pablo Iglesias' party. The Podemos and 15M myth falls when this movement's links with George Soros, magnate at the service of the Rothschild family and the Ford Foundation, are known. Just like what happened with Felipe González and the PSOE in the first transition, Pablo Iglesias with the Podemos in Spain and his counterpart, Ado Colau in Catalonia, have a hidden agenda with two goals. Prevent a real democracy from reaching Spain and prevent Catalonia's freedom. On the National Day of Catalonia, the 11th of September 2014, a million and a half people fill up Barcelona's boulevards Diagonal and Meridiana, drawing a V for victory. Once again, the people of Catalonia make history showing its commitment to national freedom. Their unanimous cry, independence. On the 18th of September, Scotland's independence referendum is held. The official results give the victory to the no by 55% to 45%. As explained before, the referendum was impossible to win by pro-independence supporters, which all media in Scotland and Catalonia knew and silenced. Now, any Catalan well-informed can't wish a referendum the Scottish way, where the treason of their leaders made and will make independence impossible. Después de lo que ha ocurrido en Escocia y en el Reino Unido, el proceso político catalán continúa y va hacia adelante. Nos sentimos reforzados por el buen ejemplo de una democracia europea que ha dejado votar, que se ha puesto de acuerdo en votar. Y insisto, este es el camino. Votar une, no separa. Lo que separa es no dejar votar. On the 9th of November, more than 2 million Catalans cast their votes despite the Spanish government intimidation. The result of this participative process is overwhelmingly in favour of yes, 80.91% for yes against 4.49% for no, and 10.02% for yes and no. Despite this result that should have implied the immediate independence of Catalonia, for Catalan parties previously regionalists and now pro-independence has only statistic effects. On the 24th of May 2015, municipal elections are celebrated in Catalonia. In Barcelona, Ada Colau, with her populist project Barcelona en Comú, linked to Pablo Iglesias' Podemos, gets good results, but not enough. 
However, Esquerra Republicana gives her its votes and Ada Colau becomes mayor. Prometo, per la meva consciència i honor, complir fidelment les obligacions del càrrec d'alcaldessa de Barcelona. The Catalan capital city, thanks to a self-proclaimed secessionist party, has passed to Spanish nationalist hands under the influence of Podemos. Born in 1974, Ada Colau didn't finish her psychology studies and the only record of her professional life is a brief appearance as an actress in the Antena 3 series Dos Más Una. Casi siempre, bajo esos gestos de amabilidad, solo se esconde un macho peligroso. No has tropezado con tus rollos feministas. Vale. Recent criticism of her management by the Plataforma dels Afectats per la Hipoteca and Barcelona's social associations sustain that Ada Colau's commitment to the people who suffer was merely cosmetic and instrumental to reach the power. From the secessionist point of view, there's no doubt. We must go together to the plebiscitary elections and unilaterally and immediately declare independence. Going together enables a better visualization worldwide. More seats are obtained thanks to the don't proportionality and is as similar as possible to a referendum, as everybody who wants independence votes the same. But the infiltration continues. Gabriel Rufián appears out of nowhere, entering the secessionism as a member of Sumate, a Spanish speaker's platform for independence promoted by Uriel Junqueras. All of a sudden, and as happened with Pablo Iglesias and Ada Colau, Rufián appears in lots of radio and television talk shows in Catalonia and Spain. This helped him promote himself and harm secessionism, advocating for three separate lists at the plebiscitary elections. Four years later, the same Rufián shamelessly will admit the lie. Pero yo no soy nacionalista. Y como yo, centenares de miles en Cataluña, que no somos nacionalistas. Pero es que tampoco somos independentistas. Finally, Esquerra Republicana and Convergencia, with other minority groups and civil society members, stand together under the name Junts pel Si and include on their roadmap the unilateral declaration of independence without a previous referendum. On the other hand, the coup stands separately and with the showy journalist Antonio Baños as head of the list. The National Day comes again. On the 11th of September 2015, for the fourth consecutive time, the people of Catalonia fill up the Barcelona's Boulevard Meridiana with more than two million people and an only and unanimous cry, independence. Catalans are very excited. Only 15 days left to vote in the plebiscitary elections. They have been promised it will be the vote of their life. Social networks and media are filled with timers showing the countdown to gain independence. The Spanish agent Juan Vivas y Solavicens, behind the scenes and using his large database gathered during 30 years, organizes a telemarketing campaign among hundreds of journalists and entrepreneurs to ask for the vote for the coup. The fact that Juan Vivas y Solavicens, a member of Unión, a right-wing and anti-independence party, asks for the vote for an anti-system pro-independence party is shocking, for he is the political sponsor of Uriel Junqueras, member of Esquerra Republicana, and Josep Roy, Francesc Oms, and David Madi, members of Convergencia, all of them in the Junts pel Si candidacy. Such a systematic action to divide secessionism against his own ideology can only strengthen the links between Vivas y Solovicens and the Spanish state sewers, that is, the links between the Spanish state sewers and the coup. On the 27th of September, Junts pel Si wins the elections with 62 seats. Six are missing for the absolute majority. The coup gets 10 seats. Altogether, it's 72 pro-independent seats, more than the absolute majority of the parliament. However, the coup will use its 10 seats to block independence. The Spanish plan has succeeded. The same electoral night, executing the state sewers plan, Antonio Baños, head of the list of the coup, misrepresenting the truth, declares immediately after the counting that the plebiscite has been lost. The truth is, secessionism has won both in votes and in seats, once deducted those of Catalunya, Siqueers, Pot and Unión, parties that exclude themselves from the no supporters. 
y un 47% eh, es un porcentaje más que notable y aparte es el mayoritario. Ahora no es un 51, por lo tanto no podemos salir a hacer una declaración hoy. And this misrepresentation gives an excuse to the 72 deputies, a parliamentary majority, not to declare independence as promised. All is ready to act out endless struggles between Juntspel C and the Coupe. Three months are thrown away with conflicts between the Coupe and Juntspel C. The climax of this acting out is an alleged 1,515 tie in a Coupe assembly in order to block the entry of Artur Mas to the autonomous presidents. Doncs sí, un empat de 1.515 vots a favor i 1.515 en contra. Members of the party confirm what mathematics and common sense tell. Per decidir una sortida política en aquest, en aquest empat aritmètic. The tie didn't occur and the assembly was manipulated. Més enllà de les aritmètiques que ja hem vist tant el 27 de setembre com avui que les aritmètiques, no sé per què, en aquest procés són absolutament uh, diabòliques. The false tie also implies that Ana Gabriel replaces Antonio Baños leading the coup. Finally, and not for the first time in the process, those who have created the problem bring miraculously the solution. Des del 27 de setembre de no presentar-me com a candidat de Junts pel Sí a la reelecció a la presidència de la Generalitat. Exhausting all deadlines, Artur Mas takes a step aside and sponsorizes his successor, Carles Puigdemont, supposedly called to lead Catalonia to independence. The coup say no to Mas, but yes to Puigdemont, despite having filed an administrative appeal against him when he was the mayor of Girona. Atès que el molt honorable senyor Carles Puigdemont i Casamajor resta investit president de la Generalitat. But who is Carles Puigdemont? In 2004, Carles Puigdemont creates Catalunya Today, a newspaper in English on Catalan current affairs. This newspaper shares offices with Vila Web and El Punta Bui. Its co-founder and the sole Puigdemont's associate is Stephen Bergen. After eight years, when you were the director of the Entonces Diario en Inglés, Catalunya Today, correspondent of the Times of Rupert Murdoch, who in turn is linked to the Spanish ex-president José María Aznar. Stephen Bergen is a visceral public and notorious anti-Catalan who claimed secessionism to be the same as xenophobia in an article in The Guardian. Once again, no media, neither Catalan nor Spanish, uncovers it. On the contrary, Stephen Bergen, Puigdemont's associate, has been well treated by the creme de la creme of journalism in Catalonia. In 2006, Puigdemont gets into the Parliament of Catalonia as a deputy for Convergencia y Unión. In 2007, after the candidate Carlos Mascort and his family receive death threats forcing him to leave the candidacy, Carlos Puigdemont takes his place as candidate for mayor of Girona and becomes mayor in 2011. In July 2015, Puigdemont becomes president of the Asociación de Municipis para la Independencia, Association of Municipalities for Independence, thanks to the resignation of Josep Maria Villa d'Abadal four months before ending his mandate. And finally, as originally planned, on the 9th of January 2016, Puigdemont is appointed as president of the autonomous government thanks to the support of the coup. An incomprehensible support being a member of the same party as Artur Mas. Artur Mas had promised to declare independence in 18 months. Puigdemont starts his mandate warning that this wasn't a fixed date, as independence could be declared in the following 18 or 16 months. El presidente de la Generalitat recuerda que se mantiene el calendario hacia la independencia. En el periódico digital El Nacional dice que en 16 meses Cataluña empezará a actuar como un Estado independiente. Lo podrá hacer de forma legal, asegura, gracias a la ley de transitoriedad jurídica. Y como ejemplo de la seguridad con la que avanza el proceso independentista, Puigdemont afirma que en 2019 no habrá elecciones municipales españolas en Cataluña. In fact, Spanish municipal elections were held in Catalonia in 2019 and the legal transition law has been invalidated by the Spanish Constitutional Court and as a matter of fact it won't happen neither in the following 16 nor 18 months. They let time go by with all kinds of fighting, like the approval of the budget, until Puigdemont pulls out of his sleeve a unilateral referendum of independence. This new referendum, not included in the winning electoral programme, is falsely publicised as the fulfilment of the people's mandate, given in the 27S plebiscitary elections. 
This lie is masked with the necessity expressed both by ex-president Mas and the leaders of the Assemblea Nacional Catalana of secessionism to be stronger and broaden the social base before completing the process. For as the Arab proverb says, who wants to do something finds the way, who doesn't want to finds an excuse. On the 30th of January, in declarations on Televisión de Catalunya, Muriel Casals had said the roadmap remained as planned. That is, she required the 72 deputies to make the unilateral declaration of independence they had promised, without any referendum. The same day, in declarations for RAC1, reported in Villa Web, Muriel Casals repeated that the roadmap was the unilateral declaration of independence. That same night, Muriel Casals was knocked down by a bicycle in Barcelona and entered the hospital clinique of Barcelona injured but alive and conscious. On the 10th of February is made public a communique on her behalf and on behalf of her family thanking people for their support. On the 13th of February at 10 o'clock, a tweet from Jordi Sanchez, president of the Assemblea Nacional Catalana, gives her up for dead and this is reported by several digital media. Her death, however, will occur three hours later. The day after, Televisión de Catalunya distorts the circumstances of her death, saying she had been in a coma from the start, contradicting what Kim Torra says in his biography of Muriel Casals and the same communique of Muriel and her family on the 10th. How come someone who is in a coma from the first day can sign a communique? At the growing suspicion of many Catalans that her death had been a provoked action, the task to neutralize such suspicion falls on Matthew Tree and Christian Segura. Matthew Tree does this in two articles. An article in El Punt de Bui, where Carlos Puigdemont had been working for a long time and whose director, Chevy Chirgu, is a friend of his. And the other in Catalonia Today, founded by Puigdemont and Stephen Bergen and whose director is Puigdemont's wife, Marcela Topor. In both articles, Matthew Tree manipulates the statistics, asserting that dying knocked down by a bicycle in Barcelona is quite common. Christian Segura, journalist at El País who had already harmed the process, uncovering the case of the judge Santiago Vidal, tweets on the 3rd of May that the pro-independence activist David Raventos is crazy because he had called into question in Facebook and other social networks that Muriel Casal's death was accidental and not provoked by state terrorism. The veteran Muriel Casals had had a long political career started in PSUC, Partit Socialista Unificat de Catalunya, the emblematic party of the anti-Franco resistance. Her key role in the process starts with the calling of the 2010 demonstration as president of Omnium Cultural, the first demonstration with over one million people demanding independence. At the 27S plebiscitary elections, she becomes deputy as number three in the Junts Pel C list for Barcelona. On the 26th of January, she is elected as president of the Comisión Parlamentaria del Proces Constituent. It becomes evident for Muriel's attitude and career that while she was still alive, it would have been impossible to invent a referendum that wasn't in the Junts Pel C roadmap. No som aquí per buscar un somni. Nosaltres som el somni i aquesta és la nostra força. Visca Catalunya. On the 3rd of May 2016, the pro-independence activist David Raventosi Gasset declares himself on hunger strike to demand the UDI, the unilateral declaration of independence for Scotland and Catalonia. The strategic goal of the strike is to expose the lack of will on the part of the 72 deputies who hold the majority in the parliament to declare independence. David Raventos, who has a degree in law, is an ex-leader of the Federación Nacional de Estudiantes de Catalunya, from where most of the leaders of the pro-independence process have come out, which means he knows them all. This fact, and the fact that he is also an expert in the treason of Scottish leaders in Scotland's referendum, causes panic and activates Spain's repression, executed by the Catalan processists themselves. On the first days of his hunger strike, Raventos hands out leaflets to Carlos Puigdemont, Ada Calau and most of the deputies of the Parliament and Council members of Barcelona. To be highlighted the reactions of Ana Gabriel, Coop, who makes a mockery in front of witnesses, and Uriol Junqueras, Esquerra Republicana, the only parliamentary who refuses to take the leaflet. Regarding the media, three different sources in TV3, Televisión de Catalunya, confirm they were expressively prohibited from talking about the hunger strike and its possible consequences.
On the 17th of May, in the middle of his hunger strike, David Raventos goes voluntarily to the Hospital del Mar in Barcelona to have some health controls done. At the hospital, he's retained against his will, falsely diagnosed and isolated. A Spanish judge orders his internment in a psychiatric hospital, where he is compelled to eat, breaking the strike and subject to chemical torture with strong drugs affecting his mind and will. This situation of legal kidnapping and chemical torture will last two months. Matthew Tree, who had already justified the death of Muriel Casals, was in charge of telling Raventos' family he was crazy, which was decisive in his internment. In fact, Matthew Tree was the best person to do this because he had been a friend of the family for a long time. In parallel, Giuseppe Maria Bernat spreads that Raventos is an unbalanced person who comes in and out of psychiatric hospitals pointing as a witness of this statements Elisenda Paluzier, today president of the Assemblea Nacional Catalana. What is this nonsense? Apparently he is seriously ill and even mistakes people. He spends time at the psychiatric hospital from time to time, as his family and friends, Paluzier included, say. These are bad people, bad intentioned people. I've just been told this. This isn't true. We know they're pretending he's crazy. They've tried it before. As I told you, I can publish personally at pages and groups, but the rest doesn't depend on me. Where do they say this? I can tell the sin, not the sinner. I'm not going to judge because I never do. If you need my page, here I am. If he's a snobby, we will soon see. I infer they've told you from the newspaper and that Paluzier, who knows him well because they studied together at the university, is behind this and wants to hurt him. Really, with these arguments and inconsistencies, we will get nowhere. The solidarity of some friends and many anonymous people and the courage and professional integrity of a new psychiatrist will be decisive to put an end to the criminal imprisonment of David Raventos. On the 11th of September 2016, the people of Catalonia, relentless, come out for the fifth consecutive year to demonstrate. This time in a decentralized way, in several cities, joining one and a half million people under a unanimous cry, independence. In the following months, the legal actions against processist leaders and the striking performances of the coup allow all the media, both Spanish nationalists and processists, not to talk about the only relevant piece of news from a historical point of view. 72 deputies don't make the unilateral declaration of independence to which they had committed themselves. However, a commission to call a referendum nobody has asked for nor appears in the roadmap is created. The referendum is called for the 1st of October. Having in mind that the 1st of October is for Spain, the day of the Caudillo, the dictator Franco's day, the 1st of October is a date any Catalan would choose to make an independence referendum. This is Adrian Radio, coming to you from Free Catalonia, a KE Radio production. Bona nit, Catalunya. Good night, Scotland. In June, Radio Hadrian starts broadcasting through the Scottish station KA Radio. The Scottish journalist Delia Forrest and the Catalan pro-independence activist David Ravantos offer a critical view of the processes in Scotland and Catalonia from a pro-independence point of view. Radio Hadrian, broadcasting in Catalan, English and Spanish, breaks the anonymity and the disinformation on the secessionist process spread by the Spanish and Catalan media. Radio Hadrian, not depending on public budgets nor subsidies, has the freedom to inform and as it is broadcasted through a Scottish radio station, cannot be intervened by Spain. On the 17th of August, on the Rambla in Barcelona takes place an attack. A van kills 14 people and injures 130 others. Ultimately, the dead will be 16, not to mention the six alleged terrorists shot dead by the police and the two alleged terrorists disintegrated by the explosion of the device they were handling. From the start, the media attribute the attack to the Islamic State, who claims its responsibility right away. El ministro de Interior, un compañero suyo de, de gabinete, de gobierno, sobre ha vinculado yihadismo e independentismo. Yo tengo aquí la frase textual, no sé si usted lo comparte. Dijo en Cataluña Radio, a raíz del proceso independentista, a mucha de esta gente se la intenta captar, hacer proselitismo en el seno de esa comunidad. Se está refiriendo en concreto a una organización, a una fundación vinculada a Convergencia. ¿Usted cree que se puede vincular? 
señor muy serio. Y cuando dice algo es que tiene pruebas y tiene evidencias. Y además no suele exagerar, porque no es demasi pero como, pero demasiado la alegría verbal. Pues si no es una exageración, vincular yihadismo e independentismo. The Spanish minister Margallo also adds, a terrorist attack can be overcome, the rupture of Spain is irreversible. If Catalonia's independence is a harder blow for Spain than a terrorist attack, pro-independence Catalans should consider the possibility of being in front of a false flag attack in the interest of Spain to avoid its rupture. The attack includes all the classical elements of these kind of false flag actions. There aren't any of the proofs there should be. They have disappeared. Not even videos of the cameras on the Rambla, the worldwide known boulevard of the Catalan capital city and the most crowded with surveillance cameras. There are proofs that should hardly be there, like the identity cards of the alleged perpetrators found in the van or the sale tickets of knives, axes and acetone they bought to produce explosives. None of the alleged terrorists are captured alive, making it impossible to interrogate them to confirm or deny the official version. On the 11th of September for the sixth consecutive year, Catalans go out on the streets to demonstrate, filling up the centre of Barcelona with a unanimous cry, Independence. The National Day was preceded by a speech of President Carlos Puigdemont, and the concepts carried in his speech don't appear to relate to the truth. Puigdemont has a praise for the anonymous heroes of the Barcelona attacks, silencing the political revenue Spain has made out of the attacks. Puigdemont says he would have liked to be able to make an agreed referendum like in Scotland, hiding from the people of Catalonia that the Scottish referendum was rigged to secure the victory of no. Puigdemont lies assuring that celebrating the new referendum addresses the mandate given by the people of Catalonia in the plebiscitary elections, knowing that this referendum wasn't stipulated anywhere and that the mandate of the people of Catalonia was to declare independence in case the plebiscitary were won, as happened. On the previous days of the new referendum, the Spanish police acts violently to take hold of the ballots, voters' notifications and posters, but surprisingly enough, they are not able to take hold of the ballot boxes. This would have meant de facto not being able to celebrate the referendum, which would force the Catalan leaders to make the unilateral declaration of independence they promised and they don't want to make. In order to prevent their collaboration with Spain from being discovered, it was necessary not to find the ballot boxes so that the referendum could be made. On the 1st of October, day of the referendum, despite the violence of the Spanish police, who storm electoral colleges defended by civilians and leave almost 900 injured, Catalans can vote and for the third time they win independence. The yes wins overwhelmingly, with 90.18% in favour, against 7.83% for no, 1.98% blank votes and 0.86% null votes. The people of Catalonia have already given two mandates for independence, one of them at the plebiscitary elections on September 27, 2015, and the other one on October 1, 2017. In his appearance before the television cameras, President Puigdemont, surrounded by all his government ministers, says, Catalans have already voted everything they had to vote, and they have awarded the right to save a state in the form of a republic, and I will bring this to the Parliament. However, for the Catalan secessionism, the trap had been set. The Catalan law of the referendum is broken by ignoring the 48 hours to declare independence. On the 9th, Televisión de Catalunya is in charge of preparing Catalans for the change of direction that will occur the day after. They do so by disseminating repeatedly three main slogans. On one hand, they insist on the request for dialogue between Catalunya and Spain, made by eight Nobel Prize winners. On the other, they disseminate continuously the statements of the mayor of Barcelona, Ada Colau who, knowing what will happen the day after, picks the winners, requesting not to make the unilateral declaration and to negotiate with Spain. Lastly, the starring appearance of Ramón Tremosa, Eurodeputy and ex-member of the Juan Vivas y Sola Vicens Federación Nacional de Estudiantes, who talks about the possibility of a declaration of independence with delayed effects. Only Radio Hadrian, the single media that doesn't follow the official dictates, anticipates that making a delayed, conditioned or revocable declaration of independence would be tricky and a deception to the people. 
At the historical plenary for the Declaration of Independence at the Parliament on the 10th, expected at 6 in the morning, President Puigdemont starts with a dramatic effect and makes a speech filled with populist clichés, falsehoods and omissions, and after a brief pause to take a good breath, finally declares solemnly that according to the results of the referendum of the 1st of October, Catalonia has won its right to be a new state in the form of a republic. The thousands of secessionists concentrated a few metres away from the Parliament, viewing the speech on giant screens, and millions all over Catalonia watching it on television, celebrate it, believing independence has been declared. But no. Eight seconds later... I amb la mateixa solemnitat, el govern i jo mateix proposem que el Parlament suspengui els efectes de la declaració d'independència... Puigdemont decrees the declaration on hold with no time limit and without voting it in the Parliament. The pretext is to give time for international mediation to reach an agreement with Spain. This slap in the face on a historic day and moment for Catalonia has plunged the streets and the homes across the country into a deathly silence. The feeling of treason is beginning to emerge all over Catalonia, before being repressed by the media and social networks that talk about a presumed master move of the president. During 15 days, a period of uncertainty remains open until Friday, October the 27th, when, with a great dramatic charge, the plenary of the Parliament of Catalonia coincides with that of the Spanish Congreso de los Diputados. I tant, el que passa és que el poble de Catalunya ha vist ara, a través d'aquest judici, que aquella declaració d'independència va ser un fet simbòlic. El que va passar el 27 d'octubre, que era aquella declaració d'independència, doncs era purament simbòlic, però és que això ho sap tothom. Ho sap tothom. No podem aquí inflar una cosa o descriure una cosa que no va passar com si hagués passat. Los grupos parlamentarios pusieron esta declaración a la que usted se refiere, esta declaración política, la pusieron en el preámbulo. As confirmed afterwards by the declaration stated in the protagonist's trial, that day the Parliament of Catalonia made a false unilateral declaration of independence. On one hand, the parties, both the Spanish nationalists and the regionalists, now pro-independence, agree the declaration won't have legal effects and clarify it in the minutes of the Parliament's bureau. Moreover, the unilateral declaration is read, but they vote another item from the agenda. They also agree to proceed to a secret vote in order to benefit legal defence before the Spanish courts. Moreover, the Spanish flag still waves in the presidential palace, the declaration is not published in the official journal, and the seizings imposed by Spain are complied. The Spanish reaction is to apply Article 155 of the Constitution, implying the destitution of the Catalan government, the dissolution of the parliament and the calling for autonomous elections. The application of the 155 instead of the 116 article regulating states of alert, emergency and siege, the one applicable if a real declaration of independence of a part of Spanish territory had taken place, proves everything as a deception agreed between Madrid and Barcelona. The lie is emerging. Si Carles Puigdemont hagués declarat la independència el dia 4 o 5 com es van comprometre a fer, és molt trist que no exigim als nostres que compleixin allò que es comprometen a fer. Jo no vull veure en un país on es menteix per sistema. Radio Hadrian, with its program number 19 broadcasted that weekend, becomes prophetic, anticipating that independence has not been declared, that the PP government has seen its day, and that the Spanish government will protect some of the responsibles for deceiving the people of Catalonia, like Junqueras and Forcadell, imprisoning them despite they haven't committed any crime. No es delito, nada de lo que hemos hecho es delito, nada. Y de los delitos que se nos quieren atribuir, no hemos hecho ni uno. On December the 21st, all the parties claiming having declared independence stand for the autonomous elections called by Spain. Moreover, they do it in three separate lists, thus giving away a pyrrhic victory to the Spanish nationalist party Ciudadanos. 2018 is the year of the yellow laces and the political prisoners, a bad omen for independence, because as Basque secessionists say, when you start talking about political prisoners, you end up talking about independence. However, the contradiction of prisoners being moved to Catalan prisons, which would imply a flight risk, and the prisoners' hunger strike simulation, inconsistent with taking glucose, start to open the eyes of many secessionists to the reality. On May 17th, Kim Torre is appointed by the Parliament as the new autonomous president of Catalonia. This represents a flagrant breach of Carlos Puigdemont's electoral promise of coming back from Waterloo if he was voted. Torre is the second consecutive president imposed on Catalans without having been voted. 2018 also brings good news for Catalan independence. 
In March, Director 68's The Political Party Without Politicians is born. Inspired by the popular consultations for independence started in 2009, takes as a reference person Luis Maria Xirinax, a humanist and activist for the national rights of Catalonia. Director 68's only and unwavering goal is to uncover the deception of the process and unilaterally declare independence in the Parliament of Catalonia as soon as absolute majority is achieved. Director 68 is subject to the complete censorship of all mass media, both Catalan and Spanish, which opposes the propaganda made by this same media of Spanish nationalist parties recently created. Hechos tristes, sí. Personas que fueron fusiladas en una guerra, pero sin odio, con amor. Todo por España. ¡Viva España! ¡Viva! 2019 is characterized by the misgovernment in Catalonia and the lack of a roadmap towards independence. Propaganda is made of a republic both Spanish nationalist and secessionist know doesn't really exist. Processists beg the Spanish government for a negotiation and a referendum the Scottish way, which means discrediting the referendum won in 2017 and is incompatible with the fiction of having declared independence. On the 12th of February starts the trial of the processist leaders. There are demonstrations to support the accused, seeking to influence people in favour of those who some days later, we will see, didn't declare independence when they had their best opportunity in three centuries. The main actors confess in front of the Spanish court, undoubtedly, never having declared independence and never having had any intention to declare it. This is also pointed out clearly by Javier Melero, lawyer of the accused Joaquim Fawn, on the 11th of June, the day before the trial was remitted for decision. What the Generalitat's government does is systematically breach the content of those. so that nothing it may do can have legal validity, not even from the point of view of its own republican legality. The Generalitat's government breaches the declaration of results, breaches the proclamation of independence, and adapts, votes a resolution that some individuals, some deputies representing the people of Catalonia, votes as a declarative part of a motion for a resolution, this text done by third parties. No one says anything, no one votes anything, and everybody goes home. The flag is not pulled down. Nothing is communicated to the diplomatic corps. No decrees or laws are issued. And everybody accommodates to the application of Article 155. This confession represents having deceived seven and a half million Catalans. The lie has been proven. It's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. Mark Twain